Okay. So this is now being recorded from the iPad. So anything you say should not be detected. Uh, anything that you want to talk about that is not necessarily something you want to be publicly displayed, I will have a technical malfunction. Uh, and those are actually very easy to predict when those will happen. So what I wanted to talk today about is just some of the work I've been doing with colleagues over the years about trying to change the science curriculum, the math curriculum up a little bit. So I was trained as both a physicist and a mathematician. For the most part these days, I spend my side on the mathematics uh, of the divide, but I really do like to go back and forth. And I really like to see how similar ideas and themes can work in various settings. I am assuming because I've been a professor for two decades that I now yell loud enough instinctively that everyone can hear. Is that a reasonable assumption? Excellent. I'm not teaching until 9 a.m. tomorrow, so I can blow out my voice for a little bit for now. Okay. So what I want to do is just briefly discuss you know, the objectives for today. I want to talk about how we can try to put more data and conjecturing into our class rather than just a straightforward recitation of material. I think there's a lot of opportunities in the Zoom era, in the pandemic era, to think and revisit what we're doing. So at lunch, I was talking with some people. There are so many great resources available in terms of how much time are we spending teaching students facts that they can just quickly pick up from reading the book or watching a video versus teaching them how to conjecture and ask good questions and gather data to attack that. And so I want to try to talk about some different settings where you can actually bring in the data. Uh, in, in science, it's often very easy to see about different experiments that you can do. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those and some applications, depending on what your district's COVID policy is. But I will then turn more towards mathematics because uh, I wasn't sure what I was allowed to bring in here. And so I did not bring any of my props. Some of my props are actually food props, which I'm not allowed to bring into school districts. So I will concentrate more on theoretical mathematics. All right. So VCTAL stands for the value of computational thinking across grade levels. The G is silent and not present. Uh, while it says grades 9 to 12, we've actually had people doing this and coming to the workshops uh, all the way down to third grade. And in fact, one of the things I'm going to be doing today, I've gone as low as kindergarten in terms of being able to do it successfully. And so it's really a mindset that I think a lot of people are already doing of just how can we get students to think computationally, to gather data, to be willing to conjecture? And I think at the younger level, kids are more likely to do this. As they get older, they get more used to just standard classes where the material becomes almost more cookbook and we're gonna do 20 problems on the quadratic formula. I will you know, single out my subject for the shame here, which might give you people who are good at the quadratic formula, but they will have no love of the subject. And so you can you know, read all this stuff in greater detail, uh, there's a bunch of different ideas behind what we mean by computational thinking. Uh, it's actually said that it looks larger on the projection screen there than it does on my iPad. You know, do not worry if you are straining your eyes trying to see it. You know, the slides are all in the Dropbox right now. Links to the web pages are there. But it's basically you know, formulating problems in a way that enables us to use a computer or other tools to help solve them. You know, gathering data, organizing data, discussing how you visually display the data and then just trying to come up with a way of algorithmically attacking these things. So a lot of times, if you have a idea of how to attack something, that's often enough. Uh, so this could get interesting. Uh, I'm just making sure that this is not on. No, okay. We have a microphone, it's just morally, it's wrong to use a microphone. All right, so if, if I have to, I will switch to the microphone. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people here are good at solving a Rubik's Cube? I've got a few. So I have a special Rubik's Cube. It has two by three on the sides. Uh, I have to be careful because I'm flying on a plane later. If there are terrorists, I can actually quickly turn it into a nunchuck and try to protect <laughs> myself. So it is a cube whose shape is not constant. And so you know, the question is, how would you attack and how would you try to you know, solve something like this? Okay, so you know, what procedure would you use for something like that? Okay, so one of the great modules we have, and we have at least 15 online that if anybody is interested in trying to do them in their classrooms, please reach out to me. You know, we would be happy to talk with you about how you can incorporate them. Uh, it's, a it's a model, I'm sorry, it's a module on tomography. 
So the idea is imagine somebody has some cancer cells and you want to try to figure out where it is. So you have three dimensional models, say it's you know, three by three by three, and you shoot in you know, different x-rays and you try to get a sense of you know, where is the cancer. And so these are the different cross images of what you see you know, coming down from the top, coming down from the front, coming in from the right. And if I tell you these are where the hits are, can you figure out what the three dimensional shape looks like on the inside? And so the way we often do this is we would have, you know, one student would actually set up, uh, you know, we have, you know, high stake budgets, we can buy small sticks and marshmallows. And then you just choose, you know, which sticks have marshmallows and which height, you know, high, middle, low. And then you give the other student the grid of, you know, here's where the hits are, can you deduce? And of course, if you put in too many marshmallows, you're not going to be able to get it from just three snapshots like this. You know, imagine, can anybody give me an extreme situation where you will not know for certainty where everything is? I love extreme cases. So three by three by three, I have 27 possible locations. I have a top image coming straight down, a right image and a uh, front image. Can somebody give me a configuration of infection that I will not be able to know for certainty just from these three? I'm sorry? Okay, so that's the only place where there is something? Oh, okay. So, so but you have to tell me where everything else is. You have to tell me all 27. Good. So as a mathematician, I love extreme cases. In fact, everybody. You know, every cell is infected. I can't tell what's going on in the middle at the very least because it's completely surrounded. And so then the question becomes, which things can you detect? Well, why might this be important? How many schools have a COVID testing policy? How many schools do a pooled testing? Where what you do is you don't do an individual test on each student. What you do is you swab a bunch of students and then you put their stuff together and you do a test on that amalgamation. And then if that test comes out negative, you know everybody in that group was clear. And if it comes out positive, then you do more refined tests on a smaller subset. You know, given the budgets the way they are, it's very nice if we can reduce how many tests we need to do. So here's a configuration. Imagine we have a 10 by 10 grid and everybody's gonna be tested twice. You're gonna have everybody is in one row and everybody's in one column. So we would have to do 20 tests on 100 people. If only one person is infected, then one row would come out infected, one column would come out infected, and now I would uniquely know which individual. If exactly two people are infected, I could have many configurations. One possibility is I could have two rows and two columns coming out positive, and now I would have four people where I would not be sure. I know at least two of them are infected, but I don't know if it's two, three, or four. And then you can ask your students to you know, conjecture, what might you guess is the number of people where you can be sure have it? Is there a better shape to use than a square? Um, you know, and what I love about this is people seem to have blinders on where they add assumptions that aren't there. So after a square, what other shape might you look at? A rectangle, good, what else? There's no wrong answer, you know, you gather data. I'm sorry, a plus sign, circle, octagon. So all of your shapes have an implicit assumption about them. They're two dimensional, excellent. It might be better if we do something three dimensional because here what we have going on is the number of tests is proportional to the, to the perimeter and what's going on inside is proportional to the area. So could we do better if we looked at a three-dimensional cube? And now all of a sudden you get to the point where students are conjecturing and exploring and there's some real world applications. Maybe we can do a better job with how the testing is being done in our school and save money on subsequent tests or not have as many people stressed by being told you might have COVID. Uh, if there's a recording malfunction, I will talk about how that is sometimes handled in terms of how that information is passed on. So we have a bunch of different modules that we have developed. 
Um, you know, one of my favorites is, is on hot transplants and the NFL draft. You know, how do you determine who gets a transplant? And you know, there's a lot of different factors to you know, come into play. One of the biggest questions is trying to decide what are you trying to solve? And depending on what your choice of metric is for success, you can have very different answers for what the solution will look like. Uh, in terms of my personal favorites for titles, I'm a little bit biased. I will go with number six. Uh, this is one of the ones I teach. Also known as introduction to cryptography. And I actually did teach a class like that at Williams College with that as the official title without the introduction to cryptography and had a conversation with the registrar who was initially concerned. And I said, oh, no, 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 it's gonna be a conversational starter for my students for the rest of, and absolutely true. Several of them had in job interviews, you gotta tell me about. But you know, a lot of good stuff on you know, visually displaying information, analyzing games, which can be used to model lots of different things. Uh, the mathematics of streaming information, you know, given how much of our work over the past year has been done through Zoom and stuff like that, how do we transmit information quickly so that people receive you know, the message you intend to send? And so lots of you know, interesting modules if people are interested. I, given that you've probably been hearing a lot of material over the last day and a half, I thought we would do something a little bit different and play games here. So um, there's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, I will explain the theory and then if somebody wants to try to go against me, you're welcome to it. What do you think your odds of winning are? I'm sorry? Not as good as uh, Slim. So you can collect. So my son is in ninth grade now. My daughter is in seventh. By the time my son was in sixth grade, they realized, you know, I'd been to their classes enough times that you know, any game I played with them was rigged. And so the question was just always, you know, how is it rigged? So how many people have ever seen tilings? Okay, excellent. You have all seen tilings, but it just hasn't been called that way. You know, if you ever look in a bathroom in a hotel or the floors or whatnot, you often have patterns that are repeated. And so here I have another, you know, 10 by 10 grid. You might recognize this from the COVID slide a few uh, moments ago. And let's say I want to cover it. You know, what would be a good shape to use to cover it? Square. And so, you know, it's really not that hard, you know, to figure out where I should put the one by one squares, you know, I'll start in the bottom left and then just keep going one at a time. And it's not gonna be that hard to just go through and cover this. So building on our success, we could try other shapes. And you know, this is a great chance to ask students to try to explore and see what can they do. You know, here's an equal out triangle, here's a square. Both of those can be done without too much trouble. Can you do a pentagon? And if you can't do a regular pentagon, could you do other pentagons? Can you do a hexagon? Which shapes can you do? And then, you know, these again, I said are all regular. What if you then start trying to think about other ways to handle this? What if you mix and match shapes? So depending on how many different types of shapes you're allowed to do, a lot more things become available. Uh, now, we've been implicitly making a assumption about what we're studying. And this is the same assumption we made earlier that we're doing things two dimensionally. So you could ask, well, what would happen if we tried to play this in three dimensions? What can you do for covering? Well, you, you can always have a cube. And so if you've done any platonic solids, you know, there's, there's five platonic solids, you know, the cube and the pyramid are the most famous. What happens as you go to higher dimensions? And so you know, the big word is to generalize. And this is something that I think we, you know, a lot of times you know, the students don't get a chance to do enough in the curriculum. We're so rushed, we were talking at lunch about you know, the need to make sure the students are prepared for these wonderful exams that everybody loves to take and just you know, how much time we get to devote to making sure this happens. But we lose the chance of just having fun and just exploring and just asking, well, how would we generalize this? What would be a good question to ask? So my wife doesn't like it when I say that 99% you know, of uh, the time, you know, she's an academic as well, we're basically doing trained monkey work. You know, if you take a bunch of people with similar backgrounds and similar skill sets, we're all gonna get to similar points. The real difference is asking good questions and trying to get students as early as possible to start asking good questions and to try to figure out how would we then try to answer that. And so what I wanna do is I wanna to try to have you explore and experimentally discover some mathematical items. 
And again, you can do this in science as well as mathematics. Uh, if there's time, we can have the philosophical discussion. Do you say, when you say science, does that include mathematics or is it science and mathematics? But so in addition to, you know, as I said earlier, gathering data and conjecturing, testing hypotheses, proving claims, we should always have the word generalize. You know, try to push this further. All right, so I'm going to describe the I love rectangles game. And the way it works is you have one copy of each size square. And so when I go into classrooms, I actually physically bring in the uh, tiles that I made. So you have a one by one tile, a two by two, a three by three, a four by four. And I declare that no shape will be acceptable if it is not a rectangle. It would just be disastrous to have a plus sign or an L, any shape that is other than a rectangle it would be like having a major league baseball game end in a tie. It's just something that should not be allowed to happen, okay? And so the goal is whoever can put down the most tiles wins. So I will just put down a five by five and I will stop. And I've put down a tile and it's a rectangle because a square is a rectangle. You can't put down a rectangle on top of a rectangle. Can anybody put down more than one tile and beat me? So can anybody put two tiles down? You have one of each size. Can anybody put down two tiles and beat me? I will give you 20 bucks if you can do it. Let me just make sure I have the money on me because I had to pay cash for the taxi. Yes, I still have some money left. 20 bucks. Well, we were close to Canada right now, right? You know, this is more valuable than 20 bucks in Massachusetts. So 20 bucks if anybody can put down two tiles. Anybody have any thoughts? Yes? Oh, no! you said the T word. You said, you said something other than a rectangle. <laughs> no, no, it has to be a pure rectangle. But the shape is not a pure rectangle. So in three dimensions, you would have different cubes. You would have the one by one by one cube, the two by two by two cube, the three by three by three cube. How much time do I have to fill up? So can you put down on the plane two tiles and have it be a rectangle? No, it's impossible, right? And so if we try to put down, say, the three by three, um, you know, if we put down the three by three, if we want to put anything next to that, it has to have a side of length three. And there's only one thing of side of length three. So we see very quickly that this is a very boring game. So we have to make the game more interesting. All right, so let's make the game a little bit more interesting. Uh, so we already did this. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through the details of, you know, because everyone here is so talented that we can't do this. I have to give you one more square at the very least. We all agree that if you have any hope of beating me, I have to give you at least one more square. Um, the conference is not paying me to come here. This is all on my own dime. So I am feeling very cheap right now. I want to use as little money as possible. What is the cheapest additional tile I could make? A one by one. And I will go for that because that's the cheapest thing possible. So I will give you an extra one by one. Can you beat me now? The, by the way, the 20 bucks is no longer on the table. Can you beat me now? And if so, how would you beat me? Okay, what would you do? How would you start? Okay, so you do the four by four first. Well, as soon as you put the two by two, it's not a rectangle. So as, right, as, as soon as you leave rectangles, you lose. Okay, but you get, as soon as you leave a rectangle, you lose. What's the very first thing you do? Okay, so how do you do that? Right, in fact, given that, look, if, if I don't have two ones, if I only have one one, you know you can only put down one piece of 
item. So you've got to start with the two ones. That's your only hope. So we start off with the two ones. We start off with one one, then we put in another one. It actually just takes a moment for it to transfer by Zoom from here to the computer to there. All right, so now what do we do? Two by two. I have done this with kindergartners. And we now have put down the two by two. So don't yell it out loud. Think for a moment what you would put in next. All right, somebody who hasn't spoken, what would you put next? Three by three. And now we have a three by five rectangle. So don't yell it out loud. Think for a moment. Somebody who hasn't spoken, what would you put next? Yes. Uh, I said, yes, five by five. All right, is the pattern clear? So the next one would be you know, the eight by eight. And notice we're not using all of the tiles. We never use the four by four. We never use the six by six. We never use the seven by seven. So let's write down what we're using. We're using a one by one, a one by one, a two by two, a three by three, a five by five, an eight by eight. Does anybody, does this speak to anybody? It's the Fibonacci's. This is a way, and I have done this all the way down to kindergarten. I have brought the physical tiles down to kindergarten, and there has not been one kid who has not experimentally discovered the Fibonacci numbers and figured out the next sequence. And so this can be done at all grade levels of just getting to the point of gathering data. Um, on a personal note, I actually happen to be a member of the Fibonacci Association. One of my greatest accomplishments is I noticed that the number of people we had was one less than the Fibonacci number. We had 12 people. And I was able to convince everyone else that we either make uh, Fibonacci an honorary member emeritus, or we just invite one of our colleagues to get up to 13. So there is an international organization devoted to Fibonacci's. There's a lot of truly remarkable properties that you can have with them. Okay, and so in particular, we can make this arbitrarily large. We can cover the entire plane. And so there's a beautiful video, not surprisingly, on uh, nature by numbers that just goes through some of the many wonderful properties of Fibonacci numbers. Uh, this is my daughter from many years ago. How many people have done fuse beads with their kids? I could ask without their kids, but oh. Um, so we just physically made the Fibonacci spiral. And then we actually later on, uh, we were really bored. We actually made the next one, which is the 34 by 34. Uh, and you know, it took a lot of time to just you know, get all of that done. What I love is when you do a lot of work like this, you can teach the unit at very different levels depending on what you have for your students. So the first thing here is to experimentally discover the Fibonacci numbers. This is the gathering data, conjecturing, what do you think comes next? And the kids you know, figured it out. And then they would actually you know, try and they would test and they had the physical objects to play with. If you don't have plastic tiles, Legos are really good. You know, cutting out pieces of paper on squares, that works very well as well. But there's also some advanced topics you can use from this. Um, well, I'll just say one more, I guess. So if you look at this, how would you calculate the area of the big rectangle? So how would you calculate the area of a rectangle? Length times width. Another way to calculate the rectangle is to say, the rectangle is covered by these tiles. So if I add up the areas of all the tiles, that's going to be the same as the area of the rectangle. So I get one squared plus one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus five squared plus eight squared plus 13 squared plus 21 squared is 21 times 34. So you've just proven that the sum of the squares of the first n Fibonacci numbers is the nth times the n plus first. This is a geometric proof. And so again, um, you know, I love Fibonacci numbers. So for me, I like this theorem, but it's just a nice opportunity to talk about when you're designing these units, you can run them at many different levels. You know, same thing for the modules we have for VCTEL, depending on what level of background your students have. If your students have a lot of stats knowledge, if they have a lot of programming knowledge, there's a lot more that you can do. Okay, any questions about the first rigged game? All right, so we experimentally discovered the Fibonacci's. Um, 
And then the question is always, can you generalize? So there's so many different questions we can ask. And if people are interested, I'm happy to talk about some other things. But let's move to the chocolate bar game. And my daughter was already envious that I am coming to New York to talk to people about how to try to make the curriculum more interesting and exciting. Uh, she would not, I think, be happy if I bought chocolate. Uh, we're not allowed to bring chocolate to our students in our school district. And so you will have to deal with theoretical chocolate. All right, so we will talk about the chocolate bar game. And one of my students actually did make a online app so that you can play this with you know, students using Excel. And again, the goal is to talk about a situation where we're gonna gather data and then use the data to make conjectures and to try to analyze. And then I know different people have different things to go to. If you ever need to run out, you know, please, whenever you have to. So the way the rectangle game works is the following. We have an M by N board and on your turn, you have to make a vertical or horizontal break. You have to go all the way down and then you keep going. And then whoever is the last person to make a break wins. And the question is, does someone have a winning strategy? And if so, who has the winning strategy? And what do you think the winning strategy might depend on? So let me just go through a possible game. So for the first move, I will go all the way down with the red line and break it like this. So when you're doing this with students, you know, the hardest part is to make sure that they play the game legally and they don't do something illegal. I find it works very well to have two different crayons so that you know, one person is red, one person is blue, something like that. Uh, any Jets Bills fans here? Jets or Bills? Okay, there is a beautiful clip about a Jets Bills game from a couple of years ago where if you're colorblind, uh, it was the red green game and everybody looked like they were wearing the same uniform. And you, you just try to watch the play and you see 22 people just all running at each other. So when you're doing something like this, you really wanna think about what colors do you want to choose for this? Red and uh, blue may not be the best choices, but you'll think about what colors can you do? That's why if you actually have a physical chocolate bar that you can break, it's much better. And so then maybe blue goes like this. That's a legal move. It would not be a legal move if blue only went halfway down over here or if blue crossed the red line. So you basically keep going until you hit one of the lines that already exists or you hit the boundary. So on the next move, say red goes like this and you know, keeps going until it hits a line. Your blue comes all the way down like this. So it would not be legal if blue didn't go all the way down or if blue crossed that. That would be two different moves. And you just you know, keep playing like this and you keep playing until you know, the game ends. So I'm not gonna go through the entire game, but you just keep going for a while. Um, it's taking so long that it's not showing all the intermediate steps. It's not really worth it. So what you could do then is you break the students up into different groups and you just have them play lots and lots of games and gather data. And again, before you do this, really talk to them about what is a legal move and what is not a legal move. And so you know, the first two ones over here, left and center are both legal. The one on the far right, where you're just going on some kind of you know, strange you know, um, you know, car chase path is not legal. And so what we can do is we can just play. And so we can look at lots of different boards and just collect some data on how often do people win. And so in the interest of time, I think I will just report the results because I think everybody knows the game is rigged. Does anybody have any thought about how to play? Now, you, there's a little bit of a hint that the game is rigged. Yes. So I'm willing to test that with you right now. And I'm willing to go either first or second. I'll let you choose. You will go second. Now, if you've been very observant, we've just agreed that you will go second and I will go first. What have we not agreed on? The size of the grid. So, this is why I'm willing to go either first or second because we have not committed to a grid. 
So my daughter is an extremely honorable person. When we go to the schools, we are not allowed to lie. Whether or not we phrase things in ways that encourage people to make inferences that may not be true, that's a different story. <laughs> and so, you know, we never choose the board first. We say, would you like to go, you know, you know, we've played this game so many times, we'll let you have the choice of whether or not you want to go first or second. And then we'll draw the board. Now, can somebody give me a board where it's really easy to figure out who's going to win? A one by two or a two by one, either one works. Right. Who's going to win on the one by two? The first person. So what you can do is you can start gathering data from small size boards. Um, how many people have ever played tic-tac-toe? Okay. I actually hold the record as the tic-tac-toe champion at the local elementary school. Uh, I have never been defeated. How many opening moves are there in tic-tac-toe? Nine. And how many responses? Eight. So there's 72 possible first two moves in tic-tac-toe. But if I rephrase the question up to symmetry, how many opening moves are there in tic-tac-toe? Up to symmetry. Three, the four corners are all equivalent. The three middles are, I'm sorry, the four middles are all equivalent and then there's the center. If you analyze it, there's actually only 12 pairs of first move and response. If you go in the center, there's two responses to going in the center. If you go in either the corner or the middle, there's five responses. There's really only 12 things to look at. So when you're analyzing something like this, this is a great opportunity to talk to students about how can we try to simplify the analysis? If we use symmetry, does it matter if you look at a tic-tac-toe game or its mirror image? No. Do we have anybody who teaches chemistry here? Does it matter if you have a chemical compound or its mirror image? Yes. And so you know, depending on what you have, the mirror image could actually kill you while the correct version could actually cure you. And so if there's time or interest later, I actually teach classes on the mathematics of Lego. And you could ask about how many ways can you combine certain Legos to make objects? Do you include a mirror image as the same or different? You know, there's a nice map, I just put it next to a mirror and it's the same, but in the physical world, the mirror image could kill you. So when you're trying to count, when you're trying to do some of the science, you have to be very careful about exactly what are you looking at. So over here, I will give you some data and then I will you know, pause for a minute so that people can try to figure out what's going on. So on the two by two board, every game we played, person one was victorious. Now, it might just be I have a really good person playing as player one, but every time player one triumphed. On every two by three board, player one triumphed. On every three by three board, player two triumphed. On every two by four, player one, three by four, player one, four by four, player one, and on three by five, it was player two. So just take a minute, and it's entirely coincidental that I might be hungry in my sandwiches here, and just take a minute and think, can you see a pattern as to who is winning and why? It's another 10 seconds. All right. So does anybody have any thoughts about who is going to win and why? Yes. Excellent. So if it's an even area, it's player one. If it's an odd area, player two. Did you prove that? Okay. So, but this is, this is good. You know, we don't have a proof yet, but we have a conjecture. And we have a conjecture that came from data. And now we can try to prove it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to associate a monovariant. So this is a concept that's not really discussed that often. Uh, how many people have heard of an invariant, a quantity that does not change? You might hear this in physics. We talk about energy being conserved or matter being conserved in certain reactions. You might do this in some chemistry classes. A monovariant is something that changes, but changes in only one direction. So can somebody describe something about you that changes in only one direction in your life? 
age, right? Yeah, it's the first one that always comes to people's mind. What is something associated to you that could go up or down? Wait, yep, that's usually second. Here is often the next one that people mention. So most things in life will go up and down. There are some things that only move in one direction. And so we can associate a monovariant to this game. How many pieces do we have? Initially, how many pieces are there? One. After the first move, how many pieces do we have? There's always going to be one more piece because we take what we have, we draw a line all the way through. You know, for definiteness, I will draw this line. Every time we move, we cut a piece somewhere. So when we do the next move, how many pieces will we have? Three. And so let's say I draw one horizontally, and now we have three pieces. What about the next move? Next move, when we cut, it's going to become four. Uh, it's free. Uh oh. Uh, the uh, the image the image we wrote. This is supposed to be separated by a bit. I will have to fix that. Um, wait. Oh, it's just it's four. Oh no, it is four. Okay, it is four. Okay, excellent. Oh, well, that's right. Okay, we split it. Okay, we, we we split we split these ones over here. We, we, we changed the order in which we split things. Okay, yes, we split things there. Then the next one we split over here. And then the next one we split on the bottom. And so it takes five moves. We have six pieces, player one wins. So not only do we have a conjecture coming from data, we've actually also proven a math theorem that no matter how the board is, you know, as long as I give you a nice rectangular board, every time I make a cut, I increase the number of pieces by one. So if I have a M by N, that's M times N, I need M times N minus one. And so I can just figure out if the number of pieces is odd, I have an even number of cuts, which means I would end on player two. What if I know earlier some people, even though I said I love rectangles, you know, tried to give me non-rectangular shapes like a plus sign, but that was for different. What if I give you a plus sign here? Would that matter? Does it have to be a rectangle that we start with? Or would this work for any shape? The bricks were still, yeah. So let, let's say it's a polygonal shape where all of the sides are at right angles and all the squares say have the same size. So your Hershey is not great for this because the pieces are longer than they are wide. But let, let's say everything is just a nice one by one square and we have a polygonal shape. Yes. Uh, but that would, that would be cross. So you would have to then say that we're not allowed to do something like that. That as soon as we finish crossing from one edge to another, the move is over. But you're right, if we had a U shape and we just did like whoosh, a horizontal chop, it would create three. So depending on the rules of the game, um, if we say that as soon as you hit a boundary wall, you stop, you go from a boundary wall to another boundary wall, and that's your turn, would it work for the U shape? Would it work for the plus sign? Yeah. All, all that really matters is how many squares do we have? And so the analysis works in general. So it always just takes M in minus one. You know, my daughter took a lot of time to change the text of one of the Hershey bars. And then, you know, she recommends that everybody eat the chocolate at the end just to really make sure the lesson goes home. And then when we do this in schools, um, we've done this definitely down to third grade, where the third graders have made the conjectures. And the third graders start saying even and odd in terms of how many pieces there are. And it's wonderful to see them doing this at such a young age. And they know that when they go home to play with you know, whoever they have at home, to just let whoever goes, whoever they're playing with, let them choose first and then draw the board. Okay, so again, you know, what we saw here is the importance of gathering data and conjecturing. Uh, we saw some new math coming in this idea of a monovariant, which is used to solve a lot of you know, incredibly difficult uh, real world problems. And then the real question is, how can you generalize this? So you know, we talked about one generalization here to other shapes, but there's lots of other different types of generalizations you can do. So we have you know, 20 minutes left. You know, there's lots more games that I can go through. I chose just these two because I thought they gave a nice sense of what was going on. And in particular, I really like you know, talking about the tomography unit 
because that's a really good hands-on one that you can do. Uh, I think you could make it work in both chemistry and physics without too much trouble of trying to deduce what is the shape of an object from pieces of information. And in particular, what is the most information you want? So I, I will just end, um, so let's see, I gotta now change this so that it can actually be recorded. Uh, let's see, okay. So I have a Rubik's cube here. Yeah, it's just telling me it's no longer broadcast, which is great, okay. So if anybody wants to, we can play with it later. So this is a Rubik's cube. It's not the standard three by three by three, yes. Okay, uh, so it's not the standard three by three by three. And now hopefully it can be seen like that, yes, good. And so it's two by three on sides. And then it has the top is a strange three by three by three. And the bottom is the strange three by three by three. So for those of you who know how to do a standard three by three by three, do you think you can solve this? Why? I love the confidence. <laughs> okay, good. So one is trying to devise new algorithms. If I could choose but one word to describe a mathematician, that word would be lazy. <laughs> so never do anything new when you can just repackage what you've already done. How many sides does this cube have? Can somebody tell me one of the sides? I'm sorry? Orange. The orange is not a side. Anybody want to try another side? Top. top. What's the top? Yeah. I'm sorry? That's a nice safe answer, but you have to tell me what, 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 is, what do you mean by top? White. White. White is a side. Can you give me another side? Yellow. Yellow. White and yellow are sides. Orange is not a side. Red is not a side. What's really going on, uh, let's see if I can do this, is if I try to turn this, hopefully you can see this turning. This is actually one of the sides. This is like the front. It goes red into green. There are my nine pieces. And so, so much of mathematics is doing algebra and recognizing what you have and rewriting the algebraic expression in a useful way. This is essentially the same as a three by three by three cube where I have pictures on the sides. So if you have a standard Rubik's cube, if the center is not oriented correctly at the end of the day, you can't tell the difference because the center is a solid you know, red or yellow. If you have a picture, you know, you know, like a symbol for the conference, you know, all of a sudden if something is upside down and it would rotate at 90 degrees, you would notice. If you know how to solve a Rubik's cube with a picture, it's the same as solving this. You just have to now identify that this is one of your sides. So it's just hiding how the algebra is done. And so I love using Rubik's cubes as examples of you know, trying to teach people how to look at the mathematics. You know, once we have the data, once we have our conjectures, how do we attack it? So much of it is trying to figure out what is the right way to look at the data that comes in. And so you know, a lot of work trying to get students on how do you visualize data well? Uh, you know, trying to get students to understand just what is the logarithm? And you know, that there is a reason why we spend time in math units to do logarithms so that when you get to science and you have processes that span you know, orders of magnitude, you know, like earthquakes or astrophysics, I heard that someone who is lucky enough to actually teach a class in astronomy, you know, how do you get something that spans you know, 30 orders of magnitude onto one slide? So anyways, um, this is basically all I wanted to talk about. I will just uh, slide things to the beginning and then just you know, repost. Uh, unfortunately, since I was using PowerPoint, I don't know any quick way to jump to the first slide. When I use LaTeX, um, I can create slides that allow me to just move things a little bit faster. And so I will just you know, leave it with a listing of a lot of the different modules that we have. Three, two, one. Okay. And then if anybody has any questions, happy to chat.
So I will turn off the recording.